now, ladies and gentlemen, we are set to introduce our last panel, which is a panel sponsored by the National Zero Waste Council. And as chair of that council, I can say that this organization plays an important role in this conference. Last year, we were able to introduce you to the council, and today we're proud to bring together just a few of the many champions that the council has, uh, and we're going to have an important discussion. So I'm very pleased to invite Catherine Gretzinger to the stage to introduce that last panel. Now the name Catherine Gre Gretzinger may be familiar to many of you. As a Vancouver journalist, she worked for CBC Radio as a host, a producer, and a writer. Catherine also works as an adjunct professor at the UBC Graduate School of Journalism. Please welcome Catherine Gretzinger. Catherine? Sneaking up on you. Nice to see you. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's so great to see a room full of people who are committed to this uh, subject area, and I'm delighted to have been asked to moderate this final panel. I'd like to just let you know that I am doing my part. I have reused every single side and every single inch of every single piece of paper that I have been given in the course of preparations for this, and I will continue to do so uh, in the spirit of this. Our panel is called a Made in Canada Solution Toward a Future Without Waste, and I'm very pleased to be able to welcome a panel of people who have spent a good deal of time and energy in trying to think through some of these ideas. What I'm going to do is to invite each of them to reflect and sort of bring us up to speed on what they're thinking about at the end of this remarkable day, and then we'll take some questions from the screens, from yourselves, and from our colleagues in Toronto. Everybody ready to go? Okay, please help me to welcome our panelists. Shelley Carroll is a councillor with the City of Toronto and National Zero Waste Council board member. Welcome, Shelley. Greg Moore is the chair of the Metro Vancouver Board of Directors. He's the mayor of the city of Port Coquitlam, and he is, it says so right here, the visionary behind the National Zero Council Waste. Please welcome <laughs> Greg Moore. Jim Downham is the president and CEO of PAC, that's the Packaging Consortium, with more than 2,100 members throughout the packaging value chain. He's also a member of the council. Brock McDonald is the CEO of the Recycling Council of British Columbia and also a council board member. And Christina Seidel is the executive director of the Recycling Council of Alberta and also a member of the board. Please welcome today's panel. You're so far away. <laughs> and I won't even bite today. I'm, this is an easy one. Um, so I'm going to start with my three R's to get us going with this conversation. Reflections, responses, and reactions. You've been listening throughout the day to some great ideas, to some concepts that we have and, and haven't been aware of prior to now. What are you thinking about? Brock, do you want to start us out? Well, I mean, there was a, a lot of great input and questions by people. I was actually inspired by how well informed the uh, attendees are here today. They asked some great questions. I was particularly fond of some questions that they asked uh, the group that provided us a European perspective. And so when they uh, asked, uh, people asked about how the, um, how uh, policies w were put in place to help innovation and how do we engage our new federal government, I mean, those were really good questions and they're important questions that we're going to have to answer pretty soon. Yeah, they're going to be front and center now going forward. Christina, what are you thinking about? What are you reflecting on at, at the end of this important day? There was so much, I um, mean, so many great take-home points, but I mean, what better way to start a conference like this on zero waste than Bill McDonough? I mean, he never fails to be inspiring. He makes us really think beyond our paradigm. And I mean, that was a fantastic way to start. But then the other thing that struck me, I think, is just the, the different roles that different stakeholders can play, right from the, the, the key role that businesses can play through things like circular economy, but then the sharing economy is so, so interesting too, because I think we're really looking at a real grassroots movement as well. And all those things coming together is what's really gonna be interesting. Right. Jim, from a business perspective, lots of big ideas here. When the pedal hits the metal, what, what are you thinking about? How do you make this stuff work? 
Yeah, I, I listened to Bill today, and clearly he's a visionary, and uh, starting with the cradle to cradle and all the way to today where we're talking about circular economy. But to me, my favorite was probably the gentleman that just left and the other business people because they're the ones that have to implement this stuff. And uh, it, it's, it's easy to, not easy to, vision, to be the visionary, but to be able to implement it is very, very challenging to say the least. And I think that IKEA, for one, has, has been brilliant. The other comment I would make is that I think that this is a brilliant uh, event that the leaders, certainly to the right of me and the people that I've been involved with, have put together. And I commend you for that. Congratulations. Right. Congratulations. There you go. Shelly, um, you're just popping with ideas. Shelly just went dashing across town to do an interview to talk all about this and come back. If you pause for a moment and just kind of reflect on what's going on here. Well, for me, I have to, uh, to, to think in terms of what's going on globally. We heard, we heard that from this morning until now. And uh, uh, the National Zero Waste Council is trying to, to get a national context to it. But I have to, to also reflect on how this impacts the City of Toronto. The audience in Toronto knows that we have a controversy developing around the National Zero Waste motion put forward by Mike Layton that really looks at just one of the little pieces that we looked at today. Uh, we heard a number of uh, uh, speakers talk about how globally federal governments are involved in the, uh, the reduction and elimination of waste. Here in Canada, that's not the case. So a motion that asks our new Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, to get involved in this and to help us find a way to, to through tax incentive or some incentive, to get businesses to be taking care of the immediate problem, reducing $31 billion of wasted food by getting it to the food security chain. That's just step one. And today we heard step up to 100. And those are all the next steps that I've got to walk away from this conference ready to do. I saw you tapping on your iPad. Does that mean you were taking notes? Even in the uh, back? Well, the audience in Toronto knows that I'm a Twitter holic, so they might be frustrated that by sitting on a panel, I'm not actually tweeting right now. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, what's going through your mind as you reflect on the day? You know, I, I, part of it is you know where we've come, uh, both in the concept of this uh, conference, but that how the discussion that happens here changes policy or regulations, and you know, learning about what's going on in different areas, and and how businesses and leading in some areas, nonprofit and governments, but how we're coming together to do that, and you know. You, having uh, Bill as the first keynote speaker to lay the groundwork. And for me, it gets me thinking, it, it's whether you're building a building or you're, I call them garbage makers, those stupid uh, coffee things. But hearing <laughs> the, the solution today, right? So there's a solution out there, right? And so why not gravitate towards that? And how do we figure out how to whether it's through social behavior change, and I know I'm glad I'm one seat away from Jimmy, through regulation, um, <laughs> uh, but how do, we, how do we make some of that stuff more mainstream so that it, we're, we're creating that circular economy and reducing what we're doing? There's such a mind shift that is being suggested here. I think Bill McDonough um, said it very well this morning when he said that we need to move from the idea of eliminating waste to eliminating the idea of waste. How, how do you do that? Who wants to? Christina, do you want to start with that or Shelley? Well, that's a really tough one. It, it really becomes a societal issue, and I think we're seeing that a lot. And, and that, again, I think is where some of these grassroots drivers are going to be really critical. Because there are things that are happening now that we did not anticipate, and we can't anticipate where they're going to go, but we need to embrace them. Again, back to the idea of the sharing economy. I mean, that's revolutionary, and, and those kind of concepts are, are going to be very helpful. Okay, Shelley, Jim, you and guys it, both. It is a conceptual thing. We, we, we shouldn't beat ourselves up about the fact that 5,000 years ago we started manufacturing and producing and not really thinking about one of the design elements, which is that everything has a purpose forever and ever, amen. We, we have built a whole global system on commerce creating goods but they're also creating liabilities for themselves. Why would they want to be producing something that is a problem for them, a cost for them, and a cost for the globe? 
when, when, they're, when they're not getting anything out of that part of what they do. So it's a design piece that governments have to help them with, and it has to be collaborative. We learned that today. What we're hearing is businesses are coming to the table in those nations where the federal government is involved in it. And we know that because we have three coasts, really, in Canada, that's a challenge. We've got a middle layer called provincial governments, but that doesn't mean that we can't ask, especially at this sort of uh, amazing opportunity. We've got a new juncture here with a new government. It's time for them to just put their baby toe in the water and help us with this. Okay, Jim, a nod to you um, on this one, but then we're gonna go to Toronto where Robin is standing by. Go ahead, Jim. I think that um, one of the things that, uh, when I got it, I've been in packaging my whole career. And uh, when, in 2010, from 2050, to 2010, the Packaging Association of Canada, as the script goes, our job was to help to get products to consumers. And then all of a sudden, the new world was upon us and it was all about sustainable packaging. And the thing that, that one of the key learnings I learned about sustainable packaging in the movement, and that's one thing that I just caution out here, is that it all sounds so simple, but there's an expression that's used when we talk about sustainable packaging and it's unintended consequences. So we go down this path of great intentions and really want to do the right thing, but all of a sudden, whoops, all of a sudden, you know, something's popped out over here and we've got a real problem on our hands. And uh, there's lots of packaging, packaging examples associated with those types of things. So all that I would say is let's not rush to judgment on anything. The circular economy is a massive big idea and I think it's clever, but it's generational and it's very aspirational. It's gonna take time to get there. And um, from a business perspective, we've always gotta bring everybody back to the fact that, you know, think about the economy and the, business, the economy that this country's in today, because, you know, new governments, you know, new policy, yeah, you know, gonna be new policies and all kinds of things like that. So. All right, I'm gonna stop you there and let's go to Toronto and knit in the next question. And then we'll take this question that's getting many, many votes that's right in line with what you were suggesting. Robin in Toronto. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, so just uh, going from what Shelley said already, uh, the most popular question here is about the role of provincial and federal governments and what role they play in supporting a circular economy and a future without waste. I'm going to start with Brock on this one, and then we'll go straight to Greg, and then any of the others that want to jump in. Is this the question from Robin? Could you? Yes. Yeah, because I, I honestly couldn't hear what she was saying. Okay. It was very garbled. So she's saying, what role do you think the federal and provincial government ah, should play in okay. encouraging a so, circular economy? So the top question there. That's a great yeah. question. You know, and, and that's the place to start. Uh, for instance, we're talking about uh, providing a tax incentive for donation of off-the-shelf food products for food banks and such. So instead of diverting it just to composting, it could go to somebody in need and there could be a tax credit, just like if you gave a donation to a church in cash. So we're looking at uh, suggesting that could be part of our, our tax structure and I think that's a great place to start. Greg, what about for you? Municipal governments are sort of right at the front line when it comes to managing waste. How do you work more effectively with provincial and federal governments in order to see through some of these ideas? They could show up here. Might be a good start. <laughs> um, they could join the National Zero Waste Council. They could do a lot of things symbolically, I think, uh, as a first step without jumping into the deep end. But I think there's also, um, you know, if if if... if the city of Port Coquitlam brought in a ban on a certain type of packaging, right, that, that we all agree is not good. Even the packaging industry would probably agree is not good, but whatever business is not doing it. So they don't sell that product in Poco anymore. No big deal to them. Metro Vancouver, eh, maybe not that big. Province of BC, maybe if they're a multinational, not that big. But if all of Canada came out with that regulation, then they might take notice and go, you know what, I need to change my packaging because that market is big enough that I still want to be there. And so I think that's the role that they can have. And, and sometimes even just coming into the discussion, then you start to see different companies paying more attention because it's just not that little local government scream, screaming from the sidelines. It's now the national, it's on a national stage. And I know that's part of what the National Zero Waste Council wants to do is, is not not have to get to the regulation, but raise those topics high enough 
that people start to pay attention. Who sets the agenda, though, Christina? Who decides what initiatives need to be federally supported and, and delivered and, and which ones actually need to grow from the ground up in municipalities across the country? Well, that, I think, is one of our big challenges is because waste is, is a provincial jurisdiction. It ends up falling on the provinces and ultimately ends up falling on municipalities because they're the ones that end up paying for it. But I think we need the federal government as well as the provincial governments to recognize the role that they can play in this issue and recognize the benefits that they can accrue by playing a role in this issue. And they can't just back away from it anymore. Environment Canada is the perfect example of an organization that needs to step forward on the waste file. Shelley? Legislatively, there is really a definition for everyone in this game. And really what we're asking, and talking about this donation, and talking about how do we kickstart the circular economy, we're really not asking the federal government to, to veer from what is their defined role now. Municipalities have to make the decisions about the exact end of stream, the, that, uh, that piece that really has to be made locally, because that's where the impact of your process will be felt. Pro provinces have ministers of the environment that have to certify that, that have to have stewardship of the overall environment in that area. Federal governments do work in charitable donation area. They do spend a lot of money on grants to food security organizations every year. They do work with the, the, the agricultural sector in the very beginning of production, and they work in innovation and trade. What is the circular economy if it's not innovation and it has to be scoped up and done at a national level? We heard that today from Scotland, from Finland, from the Netherlands. Do we have to go on? That is their space, and we're asking the federal government to be a more robust actor in their space. Okay. There's a question here that has 13 votes. So many people just don't care about the negative impact of their actions on the planet. How do you suggest we as businesses and individuals convince them of the seriousness of their actions? That's an important question because you still see, you know, you go to a ball game or a hockey match and you see tons of people who just chuck their recycling stuff into the waste bin and you think, wh where is the message not getting through? Where do you start, Greg? Well, I think that there's two things. I think it's about convenience, right? You know, most people are busy people. So if you provide a convenient solution, they'll take advantage of it. I could share you a story in Port Coulomb. We, uh, we were the first municipality in Metro to do bi-weekly solid waste pickup, right? Pick up your garbage every week, everybody does it now, but encourages more recycling, because recycling and green waste is, is picked up weekly. Um, in the beginning, it was terrible. People were phoning us, you know, letters to the editor for months. It was the worst political experience of my life. Uh, it really was, and thank goodness there wasn't an election within a week or two, because we would have picked right out. But, um, but we, I phone, I, what I did is I phoned everybody that complained, whether it was by email or Facebook or Twitter, I phoned them and had a conversation. And I had two arguments. You're going to save money each year, and it's better for the environment. They could care less about the money argument. They said, just charge me $10 more a year and pick up my garbage every week. But when I said it was about the environment and I gave a few stats about the environment, they picked up on it and said, all right, I'm willing to give it a shot. Okay. One wonders how that message hasn't gone through, but okay. Yeah. All right, Brock, a question here that I'd like to pose to you. Given the job creation and economic development potential of the circular economy, what can the NZWC do to mobilize provinces in the federal government to try to kickstart that economy? What do, the, what do you need? Money? Do you need energy? What do you need? Well, I think that's actually the best overarching strategy one could apply to get a transition to the circular economy on both the provincial government and uh, federal government level. Because what federal government or provincial government politician doesn't want to do something towards jobs and economic growth that is also e environmentally sustainable? And that's what the circular economy provides. A natural uh, um, consequence of that is a reduction of waste because as Bill McDonough said this morning, we have to stop thinking about waste but more as a resource. And that's what happens in the circular economy. So when you combine those elements and show the, the senior governments that there is a win-win situation here with no downside, I mean, how could they not accept that? We just have to get them engaged in the conversation so they can see the light. Jim, what do businesses look to the federal government for when it comes to incentivizing doing the right thing? Stay out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so on the one hand, you guys are saying you want them more involved, and on the other hand, you're saying, let us do it the way we want. So what's yeah, it going to be? I, um, well, in terms of incentivizing, I mean, I, 
I just made aware of, we talked about this yesterday, and Shelley touched on it with his food waste initiative, and I think it's brilliant. And that, that came out of the work from the National Zero Waste Council. So this is something that, you know, to me is powerful from the point of view that you've got a municipality driving a policy that they want to take all across the country and up to the federal government. And I think Shelley's bang on when she says that, you know, we've got to get the federal government involved driving policy down. Bus business is engaged in this discussion. And I think we saw good examples of it today. Can they do more? Absolutely. And quite frankly, I don't think that uh, the, the food waste discussion is where it needs to be in this country today. Anybody I've talked to, Europe's way ahead, uh, the U.S. is way ahead, and Canada is behind. Okay. We've got another question now from Toronto. We'll go to Robin now on the screen. Um, maybe we'll give her a second to sort of get set and ready. Uh, people are now very familiar. I'll pose this question from the floor. People now very familiar with traditional methods of waste reduction, curbside, bottle recycling, composting. How can we get them to care about the next step, special waste, which is everything else that we're trying to deal with here in the, in the lower mainland? Greg? I, I think part of it, it I said it in the last time, it's got to come down to convenience, right? If you can make it convenient for people to get rid of the special waste, you know, whether it's batteries or paint or stuff that even isn't, isn't in an EPR, they'll do it if it's convenient, if it's nice and easy. But, you know, we're struggling with this in Metro Vancouver. You know, you want to get rid of, a, you know, 12 different things, you might have to go to five or six different locations. And who really wants to spend their Saturday morning driving around, dropping off all these things? So we're working on a concept of eco-centers or uh, where it's a one-stop shop for all that special waste to make it convenient for them. Okay. So we'll now go to Robin in Toronto. Robin, you have a question for us. I do. So I'm looking at a question that has six votes on the board right now, and we wanted to know how can Canada become a world leader in zero waste? The easy question. <laughs> okay, how can Canada become a world leader on this front? Christina, what are you thinking about there as you formulate? I knew you were going to give this one to me. <laughs> it is the hard question. It's very difficult. I mean, we're really asking how can Canada as a country become a leader, and I really think that what Jim was referencing, we actually have some really progressive companies and they are providing some really significant leadership. What, what we need to do is we need to really showcase those companies and try to make those kind of activities more the norm and make people more, I guess it needs to be more socially expected to actually undertake those activities, not just for companies, but also for individuals, so that we become a much more engaged society in terms of making waste a resource and not being so wasteful. Right. Brock, you're nodding. Yeah, I agree totally. And, and it needs a system thinking approach. I mean, you've got to weave this thread of sustainability and uh, zero waste and circular economy through our entire culture. And that includes uh, changing uh, the curriculum at uh, post-secondary institutes when we teach business students and design students. You know, that has to be the imperative. Don't forget, we heard from uh, uh, European um, players today, and Ian in particular was talking about some things that uh, that we uh, do here, like EPR, for instance, right? And so we've learned from European in that sense. Well, we're going to learn from them in terms of circular economy as well. So we don't have to make mis mistakes in that sense. Uh, we can learn from their experience and their successes, and we can uh, parallel that here. So Europe has been such a leader on environmental protection regulations and even on the whole idea of sustainability. But Europe is small with a huge population and um, a really tight network of people working together under a similar set of regulations. This is Canada. It's a small, relatively speaking, population, a massive country. How do you create legislation, regulation to transcend that and see through some of this, these big ideas? Greg? Well, I, th I think one of the things we first should do is compliment ourselves. We're doing a phenomenal job. You know, yeah, we can pick a country here or there or a city here or there that's doing better than us, but you know what, we're doing really good. And so I think we need to give ourselves a pat on the back to, to we're not laggers in this whole thing, we're leading. Look at this room today, we're having a, a national discussion on zero waste. I was in Perth, Australia last year at their national uh, zero waste thing and there was about 100 people there. 
it was great, but you know, it's, it's not this. And so I think we need to, to take a step back as well and, and show that, and, and, and realize that we are doing a lot of good things. Can we do more? Absolutely. And I think that's what we're here to figure out what to do. But the next more is a huge one. So, so yes, and. Well, we've kind of got the, the low-hanging fruit, sorry, the pun, but we've got that all done and, and packed away. Now we, we have to take that next step of what that is. But I think, I think the, the, the ground swell of we want to do things differently is getting louder and louder and louder. And you see companies like Ikea and others now saying, we are going to do more. When we were chatting with Stefan yesterday, I asked him, I said, is there a differentiator now? Are people thinking that they'll buy your product because they realize that there's so much environmentally sustainable s stuff that's going on in your company? And he goes, well, in Ikea, the problem is they forget to tell everybody all the stuff they're doing. But he thinks that there is that, that, that business value add because you're doing the right thing. It's like gold or lead standards in buildings. People are now saying, you know what, this building's more environmentally friendly and I gotta choose between A and B. I think I'm gonna go with the environmentally friendly building because I know it's better for the environment later and throughout the whole life cycle. Okay, Shelley. We're, we're all becoming more sensitive to, to the fact that, that whatever solution I need for my city, it better work in medium-sized and small-sized municipalities as well. Uh, we've long introduced our, our waste solutions municipally and then borrowed from one another. We go to our various, whether it's the provincial associations or federation of Canadian municipalities, we then borrow each other I, other's ideas. But we're now at critical mass where we formed the National Zero Waste Council because we realize all the next steps, the big steps, we have to do them together. So that, that's why we found ourselves at this juncture. It's why today this is happening in both Vancouver and Toronto. Uh, both environmental communities, both business communities, and both governments are pulling all the governments together into this effort. So I think we're actually there. We're, we, we're, we're scoping up. Right. What, what's the difference between cooperating and collaboration? Because you guys have said that in order for all of this to work, you need to reach true collaboration. What does that mean? Christina? That's actually a very good question. Um, I think the two are very related. I'm not sure there's a huge difference, but I think the difference in collaboration is that we need to actually be very directly working together towards the same goals. And even though we're coming from different interests, we need to be able to work together. And that's what I see as collaboration, bringing together the different stakeholders that have different vested interests, but have the same long-term ultimate goal. Right, Jim, what do you see it as? Um, well, we've been uh, running our programs at PAC, with PAC Next and PAC Food Waste with what we call transparent collaboration where we invite everybody to the table. Transparent and collaboration. I, and, and I think it's gone very well from the point of view that we, we're attracting everybody. So the players are there. But we're at a crossroads now, quite frankly, because we're not collaborating. We, we, we say the word and we believe it. I think that this activity here in this group is probably the closest I've seen come to it. But we're cooperating because we're being nice to each other. We need to, as Ronald Reagan said in 19, what, 87 in the speech, we're, we, you know, we're all in our walls, but we, we've, Gorbachev, tear that wall down. We've got to tear that wall down because collaboration means wins and losses in negotiation. And you've got to give some and you've got to take some. And we have to step up and do that. And that requires great leadership. And I think it's foundational in this room, quite honestly. Right. There's a question here that has 20 votes, um, clearly a Metro audience. I have answers to many of the questions posed today, but how will Metro keep the conversation going and how will you encourage attendees to communicate and share resources? The audience is full of stars. So here, that one for the audience, everybody, hands together. Okay. So, so what, what do you do? It's great to have a panel discussion, it's great to have a one-day conference, but how do you make sure that everybody sitting here is able to walk out and keep the conversation alive? Greg? Well, I, th I think there's a few things, and you know, I, I've got lots of thoughts in my heads on this one, and, and this is one of those ones that uh, maybe we're not doing as much as we can, and we go, how do we take this question and change what we're doing in the future? And I've given some examples of how we've got ideas out of this conference in the past and may change into the future, so that might be part of it. But I think part of the conversation to continue on um, is, a, is the dialogue that happens and the business cards that are sharing and reaching out to, to us to have those conversations. It's joining the National Zero Waste Council, right? It's participating in that because there is a collaboration of everyone coming together uh, for change. 
Yeah, Shelley? I go back to that, that slide of a thousand tons of oranges on their way to the garbage in a country as hungry as Peru. Um, everyone here saw that. I don't think anyone's going to forget that image. Uh, it's simply a matter of looking at your notes and taking that image forward. You're going to go back into your work environments, but also back into your communities. And you have to decide that at a work level, at a consumer level, and, and if you're, you're a government actor, you're going to go back to the government and say, every single one of us has to start there, take all of the concepts we started to wrap our head around today, and, and ask everyone around you, how can we first of all really feel that that is wrong and, and then move forward from there? Um, you all saw that image. I'm sure that Tristam has put it online so we can certainly all just blast it out and make everyone aware that that has to change. Right. Jim, how yeah. do you get the message out to businesses? We know that our economy depends on small businesses. Small businesses we know uh, are constantly telling us it's hard to keep the wheels on the bus. There's all these great big ideas that people want to participate in but they can't afford to or they don't have the time or whatever. How do you reach out to them and make this a value add for their small businesses across the country? It's a challenge uh, because it costs money. I mean, I, th I always say that we fight well above our weight in terms of an organization and what we try to do. And we have big aspirational goals ourselves, but we invite people all the time and uh, to participate in our activities. And um, so it, it, it's a constant sale. It really is. It's a challenge trying to get people involved. And what I would finally say to everybody in this room, take your hat off in terms of who you are and what company you represent today, because we always look at the world from those biases. And think about yourself when you go home today and you're buying gasoline for your car or you're a consumer, and what's driving you to do that? And think about zero waste when you're living as a consumer as opposed to a government worker or a business worker. So, you know, sit in somebody else's shoes. Christina, it all makes so much sense, and yet there's a lot of work to be done to reach this zero waste um, goal. Um, what do you see as the biggest barrier at this point, and how do you move the barrier out of the way so that you can reach the goal? I think everybody, and again, I, I guess a message to the room is we all need to go away from here and try to take back, again, back to Bill McDonough, the positive message, the positive things we can do rather than always looking at the negatives and the excuses. Like you hear so many excuses. I'm a small business, so I can't do it. That's an excuse. I don't have time, so I can't do it. That's an excuse. No, instead we should be looking at the positive things and what we actually can do and the positive influence that we can have on the world. Yeah. Brock? You look bemused down there at the end. No, of the no I'm not bemused. I was contemplating um, a matter of change. Yeah. This is a change process. People have uh, mental models on how things are and this is a process in which we have to unfreeze those mental models and move people to a new way of thinking and as as Christina said there are businesses I can't do this I'm, I'm too small well we have to change that thinking part of the way we can do that is through the work of the National Zero Waste Council to provide solutions say here's how you adapt your business model or more circularity. Here's a solution that could be made. There are solutions there. We just have to show people change is possible, and we just have to change their mental models and their mindsets. Okay. Another great question from the floor. Are municipal governments engaged, actually willing, to spend the time and resources to engage businesses and entrepreneurs in meaningful discussions? Hmm. Shelley. Oh, absolutely. Uh, particularly in, uh, in large municipalities, those types of, of economic development conversations then immediately trickle out to your entire province. Someone might get off the plane to come and see Toronto. They might get off the plane to come and see Vancouver. But they quickly end up in Port Coquitlam. There, there, there's room for them to be all over that region. So we're thinking in terms of economic regions now. So these are challenges and problems we have to solve. We have to solve them in the economic region around us. So we're all engaging in businesses and also neighboring municipalities such that we are getting to a scope where we can all sp spend the time. It's time that's not a waste of money. It's not a wasted effort to really sit down with them and say, you know, there's only so much we can do with regulation. I would like them to all take all polymers out of coffee cups. but. 
I'd also like consumers to stop using paper coffee cups and sit down with a ceramic cup and drink your coffee. We have to spend that time with businesses, with our residents. That is actually our role. That's what on the ground municipal governments do. Does that feel like heavy lifting? It does feel like heavy lifting, but aren't we the heavy lifters? Isn't that what we do? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think the, to, just to build on that, um, I, there's a lot of engagement. Well, today's an example of a lot of engagement. And there's a lot of, but I think one of the things that I know that our Metro staff does really well, we're holding this conference today. We do everything we can to make this a zero waste conference, right? The sugar, the milk, the cream, the everything, the, there's no paper, napkins, all that sort of stuff, right? But the that, tea bags were individually wrapped, and that really bugged me. <laughs> oh, you can't okay. have it all, Shelly, for Next year, Shelly's <laughs> supplying the tea. So we've got that ticked off. But, uh, but whenever we do a conference, whether it's here or anywhere else, we're educating this uh -huh. organization uh -huh. here on how to do things differently. Because we're not going to take our spending power to an organization that isn't going to embrace the zero waste part of it. So we have a little bit to play there. I think each one of us have, as businesses as well can also have suppliers and say, unless you package or change something, I'm going to seek a different supplier. We did that with the city of Port Quillam with some of the stuff that we buy, and it was incredible. Those businesses not only changed their packaging towards us, but then they went, oh, there's a different way to do this, and now all their packaging changed. And so it was a, sure, we had a little bit of a heavy hammer because they wanted our business, but at the same time, they were quite thankful that we forced them to look outside of different solutions. Right. This is one that we haven't touched on, which is when will environmental punishments fit environmental crimes? <laughs> <laughs> Jim? Who, who wants to do <laughs> You know, while Jim's thinking about that, while Jim's thinking about that, I'd like to offer that a missed opportunity is a self-imposed punishment. So when you looked at those thousands of tons of oranges that had just been tossed aside, that's a missed opportunity. Yeah. Why aren't businesses looking at secondary opportunities? If we're going to clip the ends off beans, why not make something with that? Uh, why not look for ways to make sure that it's not waste, as Bill said, it's a resource. Let's think of it as a resource and let's not miss those opportunities. They create jobs. They uh, reduce pollution and waste. And, you know, it, 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 it adds to a sustainable future. So that's what we really need to do. Okay. Jim, do you want to touch on that one real quick, and then we're going to wrap sure. things up? Sure. I mean, you know, we're, in terms of, uh, I'm a very realistic, uh, objective individual, and, and I'm a straight shooter, and I communicate that way to my members. I just do. And I take the high road, and I say, look it, you know, if you're doing, if you're doing the crime, you're going to pay the time, for sure. So I, I, uh, I, I'd like to go back, if, if, if I could, real quick. It was engaging um, discussions. I'd l engaging discussion, I'd like to change the word to engaging solutions. Okay. Discussions towards solutions because that goes back to the point about collaboration versus cooperation. So cooperation is engaging discussion, okay? We're listening to you. Engaging solutions is we got a problem, how do we find a solution? Mm -hmm. That's what I think business wants to hear from municipalities and provinces and the federal government. Okay. All right, we have just a moment for a takeaway from each of you. So let me start uh, closest to me. Greg, one thing that you'd like to see everybody in this room walk out and do. Oh, one thing, man. Uh, uh, engage someone else that was here today to find a solution to a problem together. Okay, Shelley. Well, I already gave the assignment earlier, so I'll, I'll say to the Toronto audience, no one has tweeted me yet that they're willing to host a Feeding the 5,000 in Toronto. We've got to get on that map. That, that will be a big step for us in food waste. Okay. <laughs> Jim, your one thing? Yeah, I think that uh, from my perspective, um, this is a huge, complex issue. And so don't be too uh, judgmental and don't get, come to conclusions too quickly. And at the end of the day, the only way we're going to solve this problem is if we do tear that wall down and we do it together. Uh, don't just say the business can do it because they can't do it alone. They need everybody in this room to do it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Christina. For me, I think it's about how we're going to change our paradigm so that we get rid of the concept of waste and, and look at things differently. We have to look at things positively. That's the only way that we're going to really make progress. So what's the first step toward that from here out? That's I a think big it's, goal. I think it's all of us going back and rethinking our current paradigm and how that paradigm needs to change and trying to be that change agent. Okay. Last word to you, Brock. 
Well, I'll leave it with a bit of a cliche, and it's a big problem, like, like Jim has alluded to. But how do, you eat, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And so you've got lots of people here that can work together, take the message away, collaborate, cooperate, and each take one bite at a time, and together we're going to consume that elephant, and it's not going to be a problem, it'll be a solution. Yeah. You might want to choose a softer animal, <laughs> but, but, True but I, I take your point. It is a metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. This has been great. Wonderful. Thanks to our panel. Thank you. Okay. And I believe that Malcolm Brody is going to come up and help you wrap up your conference. Thank you all very much for attending.